Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Sandra, and I've been guiding and helping people tap into their own healing potential so that they can make their way through challenges, through stress, manage pain, and do it in a way that allows them to be their true selves, who they're really meant to be. I've been doing this for almost 20 years through the ancient practices of Tai Chi and Qigong, which make up a pillar of health in traditional Chinese medicine. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Lucille, who is a student and a friend. How are you today, Lucille? Oh, just fine, Sandra. Oh, it's so wonderful to see you. So Lucille is our Qigong centenarian. And when I share with students that we have someone who is almost 102 years old moving with us in the classes, they get really excited and they want to meet you, Lucille. You're such an inspiration joining us on Zoom for the classes. With that, I thought it might be fun to have a little conversation so that people have a chance to meet you. Students are wondering what life was like for you as a child or as a teenager a hundred years ago, Lucille. Well, it was really much simpler, I'm sure. You know, uh, we lived in a a, a community that was sort of on the edge of Portland. I was born right here in Portland, Oregon, and I've lived here all my life except for brief periods when I was away for some reason. My family lived in the edge of the city in a newly developing area, and there were lots of other young families around. So there were always children to play with, and we more or less uh, made our own entertainment. We were expected to just turn out in the morning, all the mothers were home. So you had plenty of supervision if, if it was needed. But children just played together and made their own games. There were lots of them that we did that children still do some of today, I suppose. Yeah. Could you maybe describe one or one or two simple games you used to play with? What did you what did you do to play that perhaps we don't really see today anymore? Well, one thing that girls did particularly was jump rope. And if you had three kids, you could do jump rope, two to hold a rope and one to do the jumping. And there were rhymes we used to say. Uh, and I had trouble remembering what those rhymes were, but I, I knew there were. And I went online and you know, they're all on there. There were things like, Mabel, Mabel set the table just as fast as you are able. And don't forget the red hot pepper. And then you, of course, you make the jump rope go real fast. We'd throw the ball over the house. I know that sounds impossible, but these were, you know, just little five room cottages, two bedroom, small homes in the neighborhood that I lived in. And lots of kids to play the games. We played different ball, ball games. The boys would get up a baseball game and girls kids will just kick the ball and make a game out of it we didn't know about soccer but we just made our own entertainment hide and seek and tag all the classics mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you think of the decades that you've lived through what would you say are a few of the most memorable events that really stand out for you it's actually the second world war because it was such a it just changed our lives so completely. You know, the rationing, all the young men being drafted, the lives that were lost. It was, that, that's the most traumatic thing that occurred in my life. As far as others, you know, when we landed on the moon, that was an exciting thing for all of us. The first airplanes that, that I knew about anyway. And so how old were you when airplanes came in when flying was becoming more popular? Well, I, my first plane ride, and there weren't a lot of them then, was during the Second World War, when I had joined my husband and was coming home uh, just in December of 1945. Uh, I had a, it was a prop plane, a TWA that came across the country and uh, we had to stop several times on the way across and refuel. 
So it was, there weren't many passenger planes at that time. Everything was going into the war effort. The war was still on. And, and I suppose the other thing was um, that's noteworthy is that cars were really, cars and trains were still the big thing in my day. So those were popular toys for children as well. My family was fortunate in that my father uh, worked at the Ford Motor Company. And there, most people don't realize that there were plants around the country. It wasn't all done back at Dearborn, Michigan. There were plants around the country that were called assembly plants. There was one in Seattle, there was one in Portland, and there was one in the Bay Area. And my father was a lucky young man who got a job at, at the Ford Motor Company in Portland, Oregon. So we had um, a car. You know, for, that was one thing that um, Henry Ford paid, wanted to pay his workers enough that they could afford his product. So that was the beginning of the $5 a day jobs that were popular. It was a good thing for a young man to be able to get anyway. So we had a, my parents met. They were both country kids who had come into Portland. He came to work in the shipyards in the first world war and met my mother who had come here from Missouri with some of her relatives who were coming west for opportunity. And um, here they were, a young couple with first me and then my brother, and they were able to get a car and a house. It was a modest little two bedroom house, but my mother lived in it until she died in, in 1989. She was born in 1900. My dad was born in two years earlier in 1898. My dad from a farm up near Silver Creek Falls and my mother from Southern Missouri. She was a pretty gutsy young woman to come out here with just with these cousins and start a new life. And what year were you born, Lucille? 1921. 1921. And I believe mm -hmm. this May coming up, you're going to be turning May, 102? May 19th, I'll be 102. 102. <laughs> and we met just after your 100th birthday. Well, not actually met online. We've, we haven't met face to face. We've shared time together in classes online on Zoom. What are the biggest changes that you've been witness to when you compare life today to life 40, 50, 70 years ago? I suppose the internet is the biggest thing. It has affected our lives so dramatically. Things like this, a class online. Um, <clears throat> we sometimes see our doctors online. I, I think that you miss a very important dimension. I don't, I, I don't want this to replace our contacts with each other. Those are important. There's, there's a quality that, that comes through that you don't get in this kind of transmission. I don't use social media much. I do have a Facebook page, but I I still don't know how to put anything on it. My kids, my daughter has put something on for me once in a while, but that's just something I haven't learned yet. I manage to at least, I use my computer fairly regularly and I certainly know how to type so I can send messages. But of course, I started out with a manual typewriter, and I'll never forget when I first tried to use an electric typewriter, those keys just kept doing things they weren't supposed to because you didn't dare get near a key or it would fly up. You'd have a correction you'd have to make. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so what are, the, what are some of the things that you have done online, Lucille? Your class. It's the only class I've done online. Otherwise, I've, as I say, I've had some doctor's appointments and I Zoom with my family occasionally. 
you know, there's some of them. In fact, the women in our family who had close contacts with each other, of course, have a monthly get together online. We just, you know, any anybody who is free at that time comes in. How many generations are in your family, Lucille? I, I you asked that, and I think there are only four generations. Is that all? <laughs> um, so you I, have... I, I do have. I counted it up. I have nine grandchildren. And I have seven nieces and nephews. As, and I'm kind of the, the um, grand matriarch of the family because both my husband, of course, and my brother and his wife, who were younger than I, are both gone and have been for some time. So I'm getting to gather, gather all these little, new little family members are my responsibility. <laughs> at this point in life. Uh, so I have the nine grandchildren and seven nieces and nephews, and all of my grandchildren are married, except one who's the youngest one. He's just not ready for that yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I have 11 great grandchildren, and I have seven great, great nieces and nephews. So how old would the youngest member of your family be? Your youngest niece or nephew or your youngest great-grandchild be? Three. She, well, she may not be three yet. She's one of the two that lives in Vancouver, Canada. So your family spans from almost three years old to almost 102. Right. Mm -hmm. you, how did you make your way to Qigong? How is it that you're with us during the classes now? Well. One of my friends in my yoga class, Janine Settlemeyer, had found your class somehow, and she told me about it. She thought I would find it helpful. Since we were cut out, cut out of our regular yoga class, that's what started me on it. <clears throat> and I'm certainly glad Janine did. Because so are we. <laughs> <laughs> and is there anything that that uh, you particularly enjoy about your Qigong, Lucille? Well, I think, I, I think we don't learn to breathe well as in our culture. I suppose maybe in an, a more Asiatic culture where there is this, this tradition of the yoga and Tai Chi, you, you learn to breathe better. I don't think we do, and I think that's the thing that it's given me and your little tips on so like how to relax if you are or how to if you're having sleep problems one of your little tips is i think you call it 36 36 breaths 36 breaths yeah we're just playing 36 breaths it's useful in getting yourself to relax again i just at at the end of our hour, I feel so relaxed. I, I almost, I think I almost went to sleep on you this last one. <laughs> it just takes all the tension out. That it does. And it's wonderful to have you with us. As I mentioned before, Lucille, when people learn that we have a Qigong centenarian in our company, they want to hear more about you. And so I thank you very much for taking these few minutes to share more about your life and allow people to have a little bit of time with you and get to know you. It, it's something I can still do. And actually, Qigong can be done at almost any level. And that's, that's so important to keep active, both mentally and physically. And just don't give up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> keep the energy flowing, keep everything moving. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And using that breath to bring energy into the body so that we are awake and we are energized so that we can move through our day feeling good. And you'll be a, you'll be around to see the next generation come. <laughs> you just might be right there with us, Lucille. <laughs> you talked about how I share different tips in the Qigong classes. Do you have a tip that you would like to share from the wisdom that um, you've acquired through your years to share with people of today? Maybe 
one thing I would say, keep your sense of humor, your sense of balance. Don't take yourself too seriously. Enjoy life. It's, it's a gift. Um, just, just enjoy it. Just enjoy, absolutely. Keep doing, keep doing what you can do at what level you can do it. Perfect. After all, joy, went, and a lot of people have lost touch with it, but joy is actually our birthright. It's why we're here. So absolutely, from Lucille, bringing in that sense of humor, not taking things too seriously, mm -hmm. and enjoying life. Enjoy your friends, your family. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lucille, and sharing this time. Thank you. Thank you. You can be with your classes. Thank you so much. Thank you.